Okay, so welcome back and welcome to those that uh, are new to this week's uh, or this month's session of the True North Caricature Carvers. Um, we, uh, for those that did miss the first session, we do have a video review. So Murray was good enough to put that video up on an Ontario Wood Carvers Association uh, YouTube website or channel rather. And uh, Murray, I think we'll probably in time also take a copy of that and put it on the True North Caricature Carvers YouTube channel so that pe people can go back and say, okay, what did, what did we cover that first month or second month or third month as we progress along? Um, just as a reminder though, this is, this is a Canadian forum for caricature carvers. And so um, if you're here for pyrography, <laughs> you're gonna be really disappointed. This is strictly to talk about caricature carvers and we're looking for like-minded people to kind of join us over a period of however long we go with this and hopefully build a real good organization around caricature carving. There's no fee. The only thing we ask of everybody is you participate. And so although Mike Sullivan and John Paul Andre and, and I are um, starting this off and probably do most of the presenting, uh, that doesn't mean anybody else can't present. So we're really looking for that kind of participation. You know, tonight as an example, just with your comments or questions, but in the future, if there's something you wanna showcase a particular technique that you use for caricature and carver, carving rather, we'd love to see you lead us on that. Um, the other thing I'll just remember, remind you of, we're all on a learning curve. So whether we're just starting out in caricature carving or we've been at it for 20 years, we're all somewhere on that learning curve. So uh, let, let's respect that, uh, that notion and uh, really welcome all comments and questions. Uh, what else did I wanna say? Uh, we, oh, well, we've been going at, we, we had our first meeting a month ago. We decided to go at this in sort of a stepwise fashion and sort of take a carving from where did I start by um, thinking up the carving right down to how do I finish it? How do I paint it? And so, so um, that's, uh, that's what we're gonna try to do tonight. Uh, the, couple, the couple or three topics that we've chosen at the front end of a caricature carving, we just put them on tonight's agenda. If we go, don't get to them all, that's fine. They just spill over to the next one. We're just gonna go with wherever the questions and comments are, and that'll be our pace as we go forward, okay? All right, so I'm gonna just do a share screen here. And um, so you should in a minute, see that a chart and you'll probably see a, a few of our faces and uh, again you can off your faces are off to the right hand side of my chart they may be on the top on yours but there's a little scroll button i can see all of you um, or you can go to my picture and just pin my picture if you want you'll just see me and and the uh, and the screen okay all right, so tonight's uh, discussion, we did a little bit of the opening thoughts. I was gonna spend a few minutes as we talked last time around uh, talking very briefly about some safety considerations. So I'll lead that discussion. And, uh, and again, if you have any comments or uh, other thoughts, add them in. Uh, I'll also talk very briefly about coming up with ideas. So how do you get inspired to come up with a new idea for character carving? Um, and then the, the, the two parts that I'm really interested in is, is the part that John's gonna be doing, drawing your caricature. So as the front end of a caricature carving, how do you get started with that initial drawing that you'd bring to the bandsaw? And then I'm hoping we get plenty of time in this session, if not the next session, modeling and sculpting. So, you know, there are times where a drawing just doesn't suffice. You're doing a little bit more complicated uh, posture and modeling and sculpting is really um, beneficial. And so Mike's gonna help us understand that process. Okay, folks. Very good. Okay, so let's talk about carving safety as the first uh, thing, you know, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. I'm on uh, Instagram and I'm on Facebook on, on, on various carving groups, caricature carving groups as well. And it always freaks me out every time I see somebody with their holding up their finger with a great big bandage, bloodied bandage on it. And then a week later, they take the bandage off and they, they show you all the sutures. Like to me, an injury to your hand is no badge of honor. I don't know why these people take pictures of their injuries and put them up on the website. Um, having had a finger injury, not related to carving where I did damage a tendon, it, it wasn't any fun. I sat in eMERGE for eight hours. Uh, I waited three hours for a plastic surgeon 
It took me three months of therapy afterwards to be able to bend my finger. And so everything that you do, you know, I play the guitar and you have other hobbies as well. Everything you do is affected. So uh, whenever you can really think about uh, your hand safety in particular and think about how you can prevent an injury. And, and one of the best ways that I found is just keeping your cutting tools really sharp. And that's something my dad told me when I was six and seven years old. When he gave me my first knife, he said, you're going to cut yourself. And when you do, it's because your knife isn't sharp enough. You lost control of the knife and it went into your hand. Real sharp, razor sharp knife will bite into the grain. It'll go where you want it to go. A dull knife where it will go where it wants to go, okay? Now, having said all that, I, I try to be very careful. I try to keep the tools very sharp, but I also wear a, a Kevlar glove on my non-carving hand. So I'll hold the knife in one hand and I'll wear a Kevlar glove like this one in my left hand uh, where that's holding the, the carving. And so, you know, this, this happens to be from Lee Valley and I'm not promoting Lee Valley, but this was a picture I was able to pull up. And this one has little rubber dimples on it and rubberized fingertips so you get a better grip so that the wood isn't, the carving isn't slipping in your hand. Now, it's a woven material. If you're not, if you haven't used one of these, you can puncture it. You can put your knife into it between the weave. But for glancing blows, which are the typical ones that'll get your finger while you're carving, this will not abrade. So this will not you know, on the initial glance, this will not cut through, although you can cut through them if you want to. But if you're not using a Kevlar glove, uh, I'd strongly suggest you think about that. You know, they're, they're about, um, at shows, they're kind of seven to $10 per glove. You can see this one's 10 bucks per glove. You get two gloves with it. I think it's a good idea. I use it all the time. I never pick up a knife, carving knife without a Kevlar glove on. The other thing that, uh, that I've used to really good effect is high friction guard tape. Again, a picture just from the Lee Valley site. You can get these at a variety of carving uh, shops. But this is like a, a, it's a, I'm gonna say it's a Teflon, almost gauze-like sticky tape. And you wrap it around your thumb or wrap it around your finger. And you do that loosely so that it can move on and off. So here's the one that I would have done well used. It slips over my thumb really easily. So now when I'm cutting with a knife, if I'm cutting something with a knife, I'm pulling up this way and the knife is going to stop at my thumb and it's not going to cut through that pad. And so again, another really great way to keep, um, keep your fingers intact. You'll notice that my Kevlar glove here is kind of worn. The thumb got worn over. And so I take a little bit of that gauze tape and the gauze tape is over that thumb. So I get more use out of the glove, okay? So, so look at that, it's inexpensive. You get about five miles of it for $6, so, uh, so it's a good deal. Uh, I'll also suggest that um, if you're using a Fordham tool or a Dremel tool with a very aggressive bit, a Typhoon bit as an example is a very aggressive bit, you know, again, hand, arm, chest, and eye protection is really critical. And so if you haven't used the Typhoon bit, this is what they look like. They're, uh, they're little pins of carbide steel, very, very sharp, very aggressive cutters. Even at low RPM, if you, get, uh, if you lose control of that and, and it touches your skin, you're in trouble. So that's, that's something where I'm always sure that I wear gloves, sometimes double gloves. I wear sleeve protection. I have an old leather jacket I put on so that my arms are protected. I have a leather apron that I put on and of course, uh, safety glasses and, and, um, and a dust mask. But again, you, you can see how I took this little, uh, little dog that I was doing in a, in a basket and I roughed it out with that typhoon bit. Very, very aggressive and very hard on your hands if it touches your hand. Um, the last thing I'll mention is dust masks and air cleaners. Uh, so you're going to degenerate dust every time you sand. Certainly if you use a Dremel tool or a Fordham tool, dust masks are a must. I use a very simple one. So this is the, this is the one that I use. It was only $25. Um, I know that, you know, even though I have a beard, I can really tighten that on and it really seals against me. I always have a line around my skin after I've done the work. Um, I also know that it works because the outside of the filter will get somewhat soiled from dust, uh, but the inside will be pristine. The inside will be super clean. 
So it works from that perspective. It's got a couple snaps on each side. The thing folds forward and you just take a new cup, filter cup and put it on. They're very inexpensive. Uh, that one works well for me. Uh, there's equally inexpensive ones at um, carving shops in the province and at Lee Valley. This is the one I picked up and it works well. The, the last thing I do for, for air, uh, for dust protection is I run a little air, infil uh, air filtration system. So this is one I don't think is on the market anymore, but I'm sure other manufacturers make a similar one. It's, it's just got a two speed fan in it. On one end, it's kind of a, a sponge filter. There's a cone filter on the inside. Um, it's very quiet and it collects all of the airborne dust that you don't see. It doesn't, you know, it's not gonna collect big chunks, chunks uh, floating around off your table saw, but the, the fine dust that just kind of hangs in the air, this thing will pull it in and filter it out. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say on safety. Uh, does anybody have anything to add to that? I have one thing that I, that I use for safety is, uh, I made this handle on the lathe. <clears throat> Most of my carvings go on this handle and uh, keeps your fingers away from the, the carving. And if you, if you want to, even when you're painting, your hands are off the carving. But I use it all the time. As soon as I started carving, I, I put this on. My hands are out of the way. And I rarely get cut. Knock <laughs> on wood. Mark, I have a comment. Yeah. <clears throat> that tape you were describing? Yeah. It was originally invented for first aid. Oh. That's why it doesn't stick to you. Oh, okay. It sticks to itself, mm -hmm. but it won't stick to you or the wound that you're wrapping. Hmm. And for some reason, it disappeared out of the first aid world or the medical world. And wound up in carving shops. <laughs> so Isn't that was, interesting? we win. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll just add something to that. The, the uh, uh, vets are the ones who use the, the larger uh, with, mm -hmm. they wrap the horse's legs with this mm -hmm. after an injury. And that really has become a very major part of what veterinarians use. Mm -hmm. I see, Polonia, you're nodding your head too. Had you seen that in the in the medical field as well? We used to use it uh, at St. John Ambulance. Oh, did you? Okay. The wide version, because it's if you don't have the stuff for a splint. Sorry, I'm trying to eat my supper too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it works really well. Okay, that's great. I use it all the time. Like I say, for, for five or six dollars, you get more than you're going to use in a lifetime likely. So uh, it, it's worth it to me. You know, I, I do know that when I wasn't using it and I looked at the end of my thumb after a carving session, I'd have a whole <laughs> bunch of fine little cuts, not enough to cause, yeah. but you have all these fine little slices, right? And, and so you get away from that. I've had some experience using uh, the rubber finger cots that, they, that clerks use to, you know, get a grip on paper. Yeah. And that fits over your thumb nicely and then it's, it's kind of nubby and it has and so it's, it gives you um, excellent control. And then I've used those things and then put use the high friction tape on top of them. And then if you pull the rubber thing out, you've got a, a, a form that you can just slip over your, your hand. Good it idea. Works, works great. That is a good idea. Yeah. I have a the question thing, for Paul. Okay. Um, that fixture you have that you hold the carving, can you take the head off? And I, I want to see what, how it holds. The screw, yeah. A screw? Yeah. I cut the head off the screw and put it in. Oh, I see. Okay. You cut the head off and just glue it in or something. Yeah, glue it in, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Okay, no problem. One other thing, if I can add, jump in here. Um, with the kids, when I'm teaching the kids, with the gloves that we have, the Kevlar gloves that we give to the kids, when they wear out, I cut the fingers off and I use those for their thumbs. So if, if it's damaged somewhere, I can save it as many fingers as I can and use those. Good that idea. works too. Yeah. Okay. Alexa, turn off. Good. Okay, good discussion. Thanks everybody. So let's, um, 
let's go to the next piece and I'll just spend a few minutes uh, with the notion of coming up with ideas and I'm sure you've got an equal number of notions that, uh, that you could share. Um, so, so coming up with ideas, uh, how to help your imagination. For, for me, it, it basically starts with imagination and um, your imagination or recollections of things that have happened in your life or somebody else's uh, imagination that they share with you, as well as observations. So I found that uh, as I started carving caricatures, it's been really valued just to observe things, you know, uh, whether it's something that's maybe. Maybe somebody need, needs to mute so that I'm not competing with you. But ju just so that, um, like when you're out somewhere and just observing what's going on around you, and uh, uh, it, it gives you an idea for, um, for coming up with ideas, but it also gives you a bit of a memory of, of what we look like as people and how wrinkles are formed on clothes and those kinds of things. So just simple observation. Um, event anniversaries are really important. Uh, so, you know, I think of, um, you know, it could be birthdays or it could be national events or it could be just regular holidays, just different little ideas that might sp spark a, a new thought with you. So as an example, um, back in, I think it was uh, 2013, when we were celebrating, you know, the, 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 the anniversary of the War of 1812, uh, I did the Little British uh, Infantryman. So, uh, I thought that would be a fun thing to mark that event. Uh, I live in Kingston, so downtown they had a bunch of different things going on at Fort Henry and whatnot. And I, I grabbed one of the kids that were all dressed up as a British uh, infantryman, and I got him, you know, to turn slowly. And I took quarter shots of him, and uh, uh, and and resulted in in making this little guy. Uh, Canada's 150th uh, anniversary, our sesquicentennial. I did the little beaver. So he, he made a little uh, monument for Canada here at 150th. And you might see the little plaque there. He's called Another Dam Carver. And so just little things that uh, might be anniversaries that, uh, that would spark something in your mind. Uh, I, and you've heard me say this probably before. I really like Norman Rockwell paintings for all of the, the stories they tell and all the details within the Norman Rockwell painting. And so I look for things that'll tell a story. And then I try to develop a caricature carving that tells that story. So, you know, again, here's a, a caricature of a little hobo with his, his dog and they, they borrowed a pump car and off they go. And so it tells a story. Um, it's not shown in this picture, but I have a little, a little tiny brochure that I minimized off of the website. It was a 1930s Canada Pacific a brochure and it sticks in his hand and so it just tells a little story so I look out for things like that and and I think of Norman Rockwell and how would he have developed some an idea and I try not to be chained to my initial idea and uh, and that helps me come up with ideas I might start with one idea but as the as the carving progresses it looks like something totally different or reminds me of something totally different and I'll go off with that and uh, and it won't be too and it won't feel too bad about that I also mentioned to you um, on the web is pinterest.ca. I think there's a pinterest.com as well. I go to Pinterest a lot because on that site it has pictures of sketches and different things that artists have put together and, uh, and it gives me ideas. So I saw a picture of, a, um, of one of these guys, a Sherpa that goes up uh, Mount Everest and carries all kinds of stuff on his back. And I thought, geez, that would be funny if we changed it a little bit to a fellow that had a moving company. And so that became Mervyn's Moving Company. So um, I know I've mentioned this to you in the past, but if you haven't gone to pinterest.ca, go to it and take a look. And I think you'll be uh, really happy with what you see there. And then the other thing that's really helpful to me with coming up with ideas is our shows and looking at other carvings. So often you'll see a, another carving that you, you really like in, in its totality, or you might just like a, a portion of that, and it sparks an idea. Um, I've never met another carver, another carver that has not encouraged me to try their carving. And, um, and, and I think that's a really good thing. So what, what I tend to do is I might see a carving that I really like, and I'd like to do something like that, 
and then I re remember it and then I put it aside and I start carving and drawing and doing all the rest myself. So it has my own flavor to it. I, it's not like I'm taking out a, a ruler and measuring exactly what that person did with their carving and trying to transfer it to mine. Um, just the initial thought, okay, now what can I do with that thought and then try to make it my own. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say very briefly about coming up with ideas. Um, what would you add to that? I, I, I people watch. I watch people. Mm -hmm. That's always good when looking at other gentlemen. <clears throat> See what their, their eyes look like and how everything fits on their face. That's what I do. I do that a lot. Wife calls me a weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you watch people for more than two seconds, I think they call that staring, John. <laughs> Stalking. <laughs> Stalking. <laughs> there, there's some uh, comment, <clears throat> there's some great uh, ideas that you can find just simply by searching on the internet and going to images. Yeah. And um, even there's not as many newspapers around now as there used to be, but years ago, Ben Wicks was a cartoonist oh, for yeah. the Toronto Star. Yeah. Um, <laughs> This carving that I have here, this this came from one of his his caricatures, his political cartoons. Yeah, yeah. And so all sorts of places that you can find ideas. Yeah. I, I search the internet all the time for uh, for different ideas and and for facial expressions and things like that. Yeah. Now, Dave, have you have you tried Pinterest as well as one of your search engines? Yes, I have. Yeah. Yes. That's a, that's a nice caricature of Mr. Kretchen, if you don't yeah, mind me sure. saying so. Yeah. <laughs> Just one comment, Mark. Um, with woodcarvers seem to be like a different breed of people um, where they like to share things and that. When, when we did the wood burning here the other night, they seem very protective of all their pictures and images. And there's actually lawsuits and that that go out around if somebody's trying to copy their work or do their work. Or, you know, but with wood carvers, it's a form of flattery, I think, to try and do something from so. them. Yeah, I think you're right, Louis. Yeah. Yeah, I've never had anybody push back, you know, if I if I suggest to them, geez, I'd like to do something like that. I've never heard anybody push back. So. Mm. Okay. Okay, thanks, Louis. No, I haven't had that problem with wood carvers either. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for, for taking part in that conversation. So what we wanna do now is spend a little bit of time with, uh, with John here, and I'm gonna stop this. I designed this way of doing a, a drawing to do a caricature drawing, and I taught my grandchildren, and <clears throat> so it's a pretty easy, everybody's talking about looking at different uh, works, but if you can create your own, it's one of a kind. So that's what I like to do is one of a kind. So uh, this uh, drawing technique that I created, uh, anybody can do it. And then uh, it's up to you to change. You know, you can do the same, you know, do the same guy like this over and over. But if I wanted to change his face or, you know, change his look a little bit, it's the same startup. But then I, I change you know, his hair or change his eyes or change his mouth. By looking at different people or looking at different car cartoons or uh, magazines, I can add in, well, this, let's see if this, I did this, when I like this different mouth, I could change his mouth and put a different mouth in, maybe smile in or something. So I'll show you how I do it anyhow. And it's pretty, uh, well, for me, it's pretty easy. As long as you can do some circles, so I don't. I don't draw like I don't draw like this with little lines. I draw like this with my, from my elbow. <clears throat> so I draw circles. I get my glasses on. <laughs> so I start out with the nose. So I'm gonna draw a round nose. So I play this. Very light lines. And two circles over here for the nostrils. You might want to go a little heavier, John, just so it shows up here. I, I know you start light, but you might want to go a little heavier tonight. Okay. And then I connect that up. 
and then I put the bridge of the nose. And then I put two circles here for the eyes. And as I'm as I'm uh, draw, uh, drawing this out, I'm thinking about carving it. How how I would carve it. The exact same way I would carve. So I, I do the eyes the same way. I make circles for the eyes. Here's the cheeks. Round circle for the cheeks. Across from the eye is the ear, so there's the top of the ear. And the chin. So you can look at it, you can go with a long ch uh, chin, jaw, a short one, so we'll have um, like a medium one. So this is at the bottom of the chin. <clears throat> then all you gotta do is connect it all up. So I'm gonna connect this jaw to this bottom of the jaw. And here's the top of the ear. So here's the outside of the ear. This is exactly how I carve ears. And here's the inside of the ear. And here's the neck. So from the middle of the ear, I can make his head whatever shape I want. I go real high, real low, go, go like this. Well, it's pretty easy so far. Then I want to do a smile line, so I put a smile line in. Then I decide what kind of mouth I want. So, So all I'm, I'm thinking too is how, how I curve this. So this is exactly the way I would curve this. So I put a line here. Now doing the eyes, <clears throat> this is exactly how I would curve the eyes. I draw a line like this, so he's looking that way. I put the bags into the eye. And just go over top of that line there, wherever you were. Just finish, go over it. Now you decide what kind of uh, hair. So you can have a Mark Sheridan hairdo. All right. <laughs> Big part in the middle. <laughs> And the eyebrows. So then you just go back and retrace over your lines here. You darken your lines up with the neck in, throat, with the shirt. <clears throat> that's the way that's how I come up with one of my characters and you can change, like at uh, the beginning, you start with the nose, but you can change the nose. You can do a, a long nose. Just go this way. And do uh, the eyes again. Across the ears. You can make it a woman, a man, cheeks, chin. And the outside of the ear. The inside of the ear. Maybe we'll have a mustache on this guy and put a mustache on him.
Maybe a beard. Top of the head. Maybe I'm a little angrier guy, so. Bags under his eyes. Just pull it back over the top of your lines again to get them darker. And I find <clears throat> I used to paint and, and teach painting classes, and I, I paint all winter long with you know, teaching people how to paint perspectives and all the stuff. And then I go back in the summertime and, and carve. And I'd be a better carver after I painted all winter. And then I go back after carving all winter or all summer and I'd be a better painter. And maybe we'll do a uh, hair like this. Well, that's a unique drawing and uh, can be a unique curving, right? And so I have a bunch of uh, samples here. Same, same technique. Round ball, from the start the circle in the middle, longer nose, exact same thing. And you got all different looking people. So, so if you see somebody or you like the mustache, there's a mustache that the guy has, big handlebar mustache. But it's the exact same, same thing. Oop, got to do the inside of the ears. There else. So, oh, here's the other page here. <clears throat> This is a step by step how we did it. It's like, number one, do the circle for the nose, add in the eyes, add in the cheeks, add in the ears, add in the chin, finish the ears, put the top of the head in, bottom jaw, connect it all up, carve the eyes or draw the eyes, and then finish it. John, I do have that on a screen share if you want to see if it works. Pardon me? I have what you just are showing right oh, now. Okay, yeah. That, that, okay. That, we'll see if it works. And if it works, you can just kind of describe it again. It might be clearer to people. Yeah. So number one, starting out with the round circle in the middle and the two circles on the side, adding the eyes, adding the cheeks, Adding the ears, just round circles. What, what I do too is I practice, when I started, I just practice drawing circles until you get it. <clears throat> and like I said, I'm, I'm not going like this. I'm going like this. And just as soon as it touches the canvas and I know how the paper, and then I know to draw a circle. Here's a, a woman, same technique. Let's change the hairdo. Same guy, the same little smaller nose. <laughs> I think I got more on this one. This is the one that I did this afternoon. You are quite the artist. Ah, thank you. Oh, here's a here's a bunch of the same same noses, same technique, with different expressions. Angry, happy, smiling. All. But this is exactly how I would 
while I'm drawing, I'm thinking about carving, how I would carve it. Same idea. There are some women. So any questions? Anybody gonna try it? <laughs> yes. Very good. I guess you've done more than one. Pardon me? I guess you've done more than one of these. Yes, I've done a couple. Yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> practice. Hey, you gotta do a lot of it. Practice, practice, and you'll get it. And then you'll you'll create your own carvings. You'll create your own caricatures and uh, and it's one of a kind. Mm-hmm. For you that are watching and may have a comment, just hold your space bar down and talk and then let go of the space bar and go back to unmute or to mute. Thank you. This is Alec uh, Richard. I do my own drawings for my carvings, but I think you're a little bit above my pay grade. <laughs> well, it's pretty uh, well, my grandchildren can do it, so. <laughs> But just practice, and you can do it. You can uh, anybody can do it. Now, John, when you when you've made that drawing and you're you've got the piece of wood in front of you, are you just looking at the drawing as a reference, or do you do you take yes. measurements or or anything no, just, to try uh, to transfer it? Just reference. Just reference. Yeah. Yeah. John, can you show a carving that you've done just to see the heads? Uh, this one here, I just finished this one, but, uh, I got his drawings in here someplace. <laughs> one of these books. John has texted me in the past that he's sitting in the dentist's office and there's this guy right across from him and he's drawing him and the guy keeps looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've done it where uh, the last one was, here's, here's this guy's head. Here's his head. I don't know if anybody can see it. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know where the body is. But... That's a talent all by itself. Yeah, but I, I've done. I've been in uh, like a hospital room waiting for my wife to come out or something, and carving the the people waiting. The last one was pretty good because it was a husband, a father, and uh, his son. His, his father got him to the hospital. Uh, it was like six o'clock in the morning. The son took the day off. And uh, it was the wrong day. <laughs> so <clears throat> I, I drew those guys <laughs> looking at each other and uh, them uh, pleading with the nurse to get another appointment. So I don't know where that is. I don't know which book it was, but for this guy here. Anyway, uh, that's uh, my. I think so. Any more questions or? That, that was really helpful, John. Thanks very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. If anybody I'm sure. needs a hand with anything, let me know. Email me and I'll. Uh... I'll have to get a copy of your book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would well. you share? Is there any way you could share the screenshot that we had? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the uh, Ontario Ma Wood Carving Magazine, uh, the one with all the step-by-step. The -step. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, thanks. All right. And so, you know, clearly John is an exceptional artist and is able to draw these things um, and, and uses that as a process. Um, many of the other character carvers that I know have um, used sculpting, and I know John does that as well. But uh, that's what we're going to turn our attention to now is how can you, um, you know, after you've maybe thought a little bit about what the facial features are going to look like, how can you nail down the posture and the, the attitude of the carving? And so that's what Mike has prepared for us to talk a little bit about, um, about sculpting. So Mike, we'll hand it over to you. 
<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, I guess uh, first thing I want to say is, uh, hi, Karen. I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, it has it's been good to see long. you on here. Yeah, yeah, I haven't gone away. <laughs> yeah, there's no traveling to Minnesota anymore, is there? Nope. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so Karen already knows what I'm going to talk about because uh, we've both been taught by the master carver in uh, Minnesota, Marv Kaiser's hat, how to make the uh, sculpture of your carving before you actually get into it, a, a clay model of it. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, first off, uh, you got to come up with an idea. Uh, I use Google Images. I, I think of what I'm going to uh, do and come up with a simple drawing. And then the next step is to actually make the, the wire armature to the way that you want it to go onto the, onto the block of wood. Now, most of my carvings are four by four. So I'm going to use a four by four base to put the armature onto. And the first step that I do, I'm going to move my camera a bit so that you can see what I'm dealing with here. Now, this is a uh, regular wire, house wire, a 14 or a 12 gauge wire. The one stretch of it is 18 inches. And the other one is nine inches. The 18 inch is going to be for the legs and the body. And the nine inch is actually going to be for the arms. This is what I end up with. It's like a little stick figure. Can you see that uh, clearly? Looks good. Okay. So. Once I get that done, the next thing you know, you put it on a base, okay? So this is what it looks like. That's, I just put it simply on the base here because it's, uh, I'm not gonna come up with a design right now on Mike, it. Mike, just pull it back towards you a little bit. Okay, can you yeah. see it yeah. now? That's okay. Base. Yeah. And this is, what I use. It's uh, the name of it. Can you see that? Yes, it's Plastilina. I pick it up at, at Michael's in the, in the United States. I'm not sure if they have it over here, but they would have something comparable, definitely. So it's, it softens up pretty good in your hands. It's reusable. So I, I just keep on reusing the same stuff. So I'm just going to throw some on this, on this, just to show you how I'm building up the model. So I'm at this point in time, I just, uh, I just want to get the body filled out. So it's going to look like it's just going to build up the clay on the arms and the legs, somewhat like that. I can't really do a lot of that because it's been out in the cold garage. So it's like I've been working this clay since we started talking at, at 630 <laughs> to get it to, to work because it's so cold. Uh, now, I will show you again the same model that I showed. Tuesday, this is what one of these models will look like. And then from that. Mike, just push your camera back so we can see more of it there. Yep. Yeah, that's good. Right there? What about there? Okay. Thanks. I can't see. I'm only seeing a little picture. And <laughs> so this is what a finished model looks like. Now, I only use the clay if I'm going to have a lot of action in the carvings. If it's just going to be a stand up, stand alone kind of guy with the legs straight and everything, I'm not going to do this clay model for that. But 
I have a lot of movement in this carving. So you, you can see the, the one arm is, is up around the head. The other arm is bent with a trowel in his hand. He's got one foot sticking, sticking bent and the other one stuck inside the concrete. That's what, okay. So with that, with this model done, I'm going to lay it on the, try to keep it even. And this is the pencil that I use. That's another trick that uh, Mr. Kaiser sat uh, had. He shaved down a pencil. So it's basically almost a lead because you want to get that as close to the, the clay model as possible to, to run the pencil along the clay model onto a piece of paper to get your shapes of that carving. Now, this is the front view of that carving. The one that's gonna be your front cutout. And that is the side. So with those, I put one on, one on the front of the four by four, the other one on the side, and you have to make sure you do it on the right side. You know, it's one of those things. I'll drill out any of the holes before I even cut, and then I'm going to cut this on my bandsaw, these shapes, which will end up, this is my finished product. Well, not finished yet. I still have to put details on it, but as you can see, the base is part of the project. The arm is bent. The other arm is up, up to the head, pushing down on the hat. That's, that's about it. If there's any questions, I can uh, answer them. Is the, like hat, is the head separate from the body? No, I, I'm, uh, I guess, uh, the evil, the evil side of everything has to be one piece for me. You're the rebel. Well, <laughs> push your camera a bit further there, bud. Push. There. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, everything is is uh, one piece on mine. Uh, there's not very often that I add pieces onto my carving side. Well, that's one of the things like. Uh, Karen uh, Walker there and myself have have gone out to the pilgrimage out to see Marv Kaiser sat. Now, if, if you ever have seen any of his works, his are all one piece. They're carved out of, out of a block of wood and they're amazing. Uh, I think that you can uh, actually go on to the Caricature Carvers of America and actually see his uh, a tour of his studio. So uh, because of that, I just like the, the challenge of trying to get everything in that one piece. Uh, even, you know, if you decide that you want to uh, turn your head on your carving, you do that with the clay and you figure out that before you start carving that carving. So it's just, it's a different challenge. It's, it's the way I enjoy it, that's all. Now on, on your sculptures, Mike, how much detail do you usually add to your sculpture before you start carving? I, I have it more for where I'm going to have the limbs and the head direction and everything. I don't try to put a lot of detail into it because uh, once you're into the carving, you might decide that you want to change up the, the facial features or you want to change up uh, something the details, the clothing he's wearing or something. So I don't really go heavily into the detail on the, on the clothing or the, or the facial features or anything. Just try to get a nose in there and some ears, but, but develop it as you go into your uh, carving of the wood. Richard here, I have a question. Um, as this group uh, progresses and moves along, for those of us who don't have a bandsaw, or access to one readily, would it be possible for you guys to consider doing rough outs so we can 
see what you have done, buy the rough out, and then we can uh, play away with it and hope that we can be uh, somewhat successful. Well, that's, that's definitely a, a good idea that we could provide you with some cutouts. Rough outs are, are uh, sort of a different, a different game for me. Uh, that means that you would have a, a, something done on a duplicator uh, to create that same sort of, uh, a cutout is something off the bandsaw, a rough out is off of a duplicator. So uh, I, I cut out, uh, do a lot of cutouts, but I, I never have had anything duplicated. But, but I think a cutout is probably a good idea, right, Mike? Uh, you know, yeah. if, if we go through all these steps right to painting and finishing, maybe we'll take on a small project and we'll all work on it together. And, uh, you know, if, if we're still uh, in quarantine, we'll can, we can send people a, a small cutout that need one or the pattern if they have a bandsaw. Or, and if we're, if we're able to get together again at, at our get togethers, we can bring those cutouts and just and stepwise work through them, right? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I, I, you know, it would it it'd be nice if we didn't have this quarantine thing, so that we could get together and yeah. and you know have uh, groups of ten or something try different carvings with different people and and. Yeah, that's right. Now, I, I I'm not yeah. sure I I heard who asked the original question, but um, a question similar to that was asked last time we were together, and uh, the thought was that. Often, if you go to um, a community workshop center or a, a senior center or even a school workshop and ask them to cut out your pattern for you, they'd be glad to do that. So that'd be another before, way to get the cut out. Before I had access, can you hear me? Yep. Before I had access to a bandsaw, I used to lay out the pattern in front view, side view, and then I would just use a back saw to oh, make yeah. a, whole lot of, a whole lot of uh, stop cuts. Yeah mostly across the grain yeah and then i would just use like a carpenter's chisel and uh and knock out the sections yeah it, it takes a little longer but it uh it, it works when you don't have a bandsaw yeah yeah well ch check your area wherever you live and uh and see if in fact you can get out to a senior center they usually have a pretty well equipped uh workshop i know the one here in kingston does and they'd be glad to to do all that and save you all the back back sawing Mark, unfortunately, they're all closed right now. Yeah, you know, the Kingston one's still open. I'm, I'm not going to it, but uh, the Kingston one is open for whatever reason. Would you get anywhere with a jigsaw clamping down the piece? Mm -hmm. You're thinking a hand saw, like a hand jigsaw? Or... Either That's a, hand a lot or... of work, though. Yeah. Dave Wilson here. A coping saw works quite well for cutting out small projects like that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, the, the carving that you, you were showing us, um, you, you included the, the base right on the, the carving. Does that mean that the top of the base is always going to be end grain that you're trying to get detail into? Yes, it is. Usually, uh, a lot of my different carvings that I've done that with, I've actually carved in a cobblestone effect or something as though it's a, an old street because most of the carvings that I do are are of days gone by type of thing, you know, uh, the, the late 1890s, early 1900s type of thing. Because as uh, Mark said, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Norman Rockwell's and uh, I love, looking at his artwork and and it really brings out a lot of great ideas not quite from his pictures but uh you know just it's a it's a good place to to look at at his artwork and and see the different things he can do uh craig severin here mike i have a question um i'm gonna go back a step so you got this wire and you put the modeling clay on what are you using to carve it? You use a knife, won't it stick to it, or do you use wood or plastic? I mold it with my hands. The 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 clay itself, I mold it with my hands, and then I have uh, one second. I'll 
I have almost like dental picks that I use to shift things around. So like, see this has a, the flat uh, paddle on it, sharp point on the other side, different sized, just to, to, to move the stuff around. But for the most part, I'm making the shape because it's really soft, the clay is really soft. I can mold it mainly with my hands. It's just uh, pushing it around final detail, which I don't usually do too much final detail. I use those like dental picks almost. Oh, thanks. That's a good idea. What Richard, think? Richard here again. Um, my wife used to do a lot of cake decorating and all of their tools are very similar to what you're you're talking about there. Uh, and they're pretty specific in the different shapes and the handles and the paddles. It would be easier to use. Yeah, using some, of, using some of Peggy's utensils could be dangerous to my health though, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken uh, just three eighths or quarter inch doweling and I just grind them down and I make my own tools out of the doweling and it works fine. That's a great idea. Yeah. Good idea. Mike, with those tools that you showed and what the other fellows are speaking to, um, the amount of detail that I've put into my models, uh, I find the model really useful for detailing in wrinkles because that's probably the toughest part I, I have in carving is, is taking a pic, picture of a person with the wrinkled shirt and getting that three dimensionally and understanding where this wrinkle goes at the back. With those tools, you can do that in the clay and now you have a three dimensional model. So before you start cutting into your wood, you know where that wrinkle is gonna lie. That's helpful to me. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Or you get your wife, I get my wife to model a certain thing you know, uh, put a shirt on or a coat on. Or yeah. She uh, did a Santa Claus with a quilt on her arm. So I took a picture of it with that quilt, all the folds and everything. It's another way of doing it. Yeah. Even, even having a, a good sized mirror in your workshop so you can actually look at your own facial expressions and, yeah. and yeah. things like that uh, are good help too. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I was just watching a, a carver out of the U.S. and he's he 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 does carvings in bark, but his faces are just like perfect. His faces are realistic and perfect, and he was making the case that that's the most important tool he has in his uh, workshop is a handheld mirror, so that he can take a look at himself and see where the eyes are and where the wrinkles are and yeah. the bags under your eyes and that kind of thing. But that was a good point. Which which carver was that? Alan. Alan look La lacasse that's it yeah yeah he's he's just a young kid too i know he's just an incredible artist but uh, I, I thought it was interesting that's the point he made is that the the most useful tool he has in the shop is a is a handheld mirror yeah check out his father's carvings oh is that right his father's better than him wow <laughs> wow way way better or whatever it's i end up taking a lot of selfies yeah that'd do it yeah yeah are you familiar with Neil Cox? Oh yeah. yeah. He uses two, he uses two mirrors, one straight on and the other one at a forty-five degree angle to one side, hmm. so he can see more features of himself. Same thing. And yeah. What a face would look like. Yeah. Uh, when he's done, he's well. You know what his work's like. Yeah, that's right. It's perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike. That was really interesting. So. Um, we, we got through our three topics pretty, pretty quickly here. And so thanks for your questions and your comments. Um, going forward, uh, we, we wanna take it to the next step. So we've, you know, we've developed the initial drawing, we've modeled, the next step would be um, roughing it in. Like how, what are the tools and methods we use to rough in the carving? Followed by how do you detail in the carving? How, how do you add the details and what details would you add? And, different, and everybody has different methods, as Mike said, in, in adding the details. And then finally, how to finish and paint. So those are the three topics we'll, uh, we'll take on next and be prepared for you know, maybe a month from now to, uh, to at least uh, get at a couple of those topics.
All right. So if there are any, if there aren't any other comments or, or questions, maybe we'll close for tonight. What, one of the things that is obvious is that we had started with about 24 people uh, with our group. And I see there's 30 on the call tonight. If, if you weren't part of the original uh, group that uh, would have met a month ago, uh, I don't have you on our distribution list. So if you wouldn't mind sending me your email so that I can include you on the distribution list so that when we send out the next email for the next meeting that you get it, okay? And Okay, folks, any other uh, comments or questions before we close for tonight? Okay, thanks folks. Thanks, uh, John Paul. Thanks, uh, Mike. That's terrific. And uh, we'll get a little note out in regard to what we're going to do with um, our next session, okay?